Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you all for being here. Joining me today, as usual, is Dr. Joe Canner of the Office of Public Health. He will make remarks uh, after a while and then answer your questions. Um, anybody who's been paying attention to the news lately, whether you're looking at um, worldwide news coverage of the Northern Hemisphere, whether you're looking at the United States of America, or whether you've been paying attention here in Louisiana, uh, you know that COVID-19 is going in the wrong direction uh, and it's uh, moving pretty fast in the wrong direction. It is very clear that Louisiana, like just about all of the rest of the country, is experiencing a third surge of COVID-19. In November alone, the United States had more new cases of COVID-19 than in any other month of the pandemic and hospitalizations are also at a record high nationally, higher than the spring surge, higher than the summer surge. Yesterday, the United States added more than 169,000 new cases, that was one day, and reported 889 of our fellow Americans died. This week's White House Coronavirus Task Force report, <coughs> excuse me, shows that Louisiana has 474 new cases per 100,000 people. So that's 474 per 100,000. Last week, we had 172 new cases per 100,000 people. The national average right now is 356 cases per 100,000. So this is the first week in many, many weeks when Louisiana actually has more new cases than the national average. Today, we are reporting 3,266 new cases. I am also very sadly reporting 39 additional people have lost their lives in Louisiana to this virus. That brings the total number of deaths to 6,323. We're reporting 1,052 hospitalizations. And I want to point out that back on November 1st, at the start of this month, we had less than 600. So we're reporting 1,052 today, which is up 40 from yesterday. And in fact, just over the last 11 days or so, we've added more than 350 net new hospitalizations of COVID-19. There are 113 inpatients on mechanical ventilators. And I will tell you, when we see what's happening all across the state and in all regions of our state, we have to be very concerned about hospitalizations and making sure that we retain the capacity needed to deliver life-saving care, both to COVID patients and to non-COVID patients. And because of the trajectory that we are on and have been on for the last 10 days or so, it is imperative that we take action and that we take action now. Remember, if, if we could flip a switch and get 100% compliance with all the mitigation measures and, measures and all of the restrictions, you're still two weeks from seeing an improvement in your numbers. And so while we have every hope and expectation that with the changes I will announce shortly, we will flatten the curve again, we are in for a rough patch. And the degree to which we flatten the curve, and in fact, whether or not we're successful is gonna depend upon what every Louisianan does uh, in response to this announcement today. So I'm announcing that we're gonna take a step back to a revised phase two meaning uh, that there are some modifications. Um, we're not just gonna go back to phase two as, as we um, went through phase two originally. And I would remind everybody that we flattened the curve coming out of that summer surge while we were in phase two. We did it with a mask mandate um, and, and we did it with those phase two restrictions. So I'm not asking the people of Louisiana to do something for the very first time here. Uh, we know that these things will work, but we've got to have more compliance, more adherence to the restrictions and the mitigation measures. And before I get into what 
that modified phase two will look like, I do want you to see the same information that I was presented with when making this decision. You know, they say a picture is worth a thousand words, and I find that that is certainly the case when it comes to looking at COVID and trends uh, related to surges. Um, and I think it's especially important that we do everything we can to get people's attention now ahead of the Thanksgiving holiday and before they get uh, wrapped up in, in the, the extended holiday season um, and, and so that we can get on the right track again. I want you to know the data includes information uh, through Friday, uh, November the 20th. So I'm going to ask Dr. Cantor to come up and go through the gating criteria slides uh, that, that we've been looking at since Friday and, and all through the weekend and then again uh, on yesterday and as, uh, actually again this morning uh, because we've been working overtime uh, to try to digest this information, make sure it was the most complete and accurate picture of what's happening uh, in Louisiana. So Dr. Cantor is going to come up and go through the gating uh, criteria slides um, and then he'll take your questions and when, when he's done, I'll come back up and finish my remarks and I'll talk specifically about what these new restrictions uh, will look like. Dr. Kenner. Thank you, Governor. Thank you for your leadership. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to um, just begin by uh, thanking the, uh, the National Guard uh, for all they've done for the folks here at GOSEP, for all their support, and for the Department of Health um, LDH staff. They've been working really hard throughout this entire ordeal, and they'll be working uh, over the next few days, over the holiday. A and I'm going to show you why they're going to be doing that. Go ahead to the next slide, please. So what I'll run through now is what we consider the, the gating criteria slides. And uh, this is an epidemiologic overview of where we are, both on a statewide level and region by region. We present these to the governor ahead of any decision to move backwards or forwards on phases, and, and oftentimes uh, a few times in between there as well. And uh, you know, I'll just let you know before we get going, what we're seeing now is as concerning as it has ever been. There is no question about that. We were lucky for a few weeks watching the rest of the country really go up and up with COVID, and, and we were sitting here kind of waiting, that luck has clearly run out now and, and we are exactly where uh, a large part of the country is. Um, and and that's, that's concerning for us because we know, we know what happens down the road if, if we don't act. So if you take a look uh, right now, um, on the top left, you'll see the percentage of patients coming into emergency departments across the state with symptoms suggestive of COVID, cough, fever, shortness of breath. And uh, you can see it went up during the first uh, spike in late March, early April, came back down, went up during the second spike in July, August, came back down, and now is going back up again. If you look at the top right, you will see new cases coming in um, on, a, on a rolling seven-day average. So new cases diagnosed, essentially positive tests in unique individuals. We can see the first spike, which was really if folks will remember, focused mostly in um, greater New Orleans area, a little bit in Baton Rouge, a little bit um, elsewhere, but mostly in the urban area. The second spike, which was truly statewide, and now that increase that we're on on the far right of that graph is almost identical <laughs> to where we were going up on that second spike. And we clearly have not hit the top of that yet. Very concerning. If you look down on the bottom left, uh, you'll see a line graph and then a bar graph below that. The bar graph is percent positivity. So the percent of, of tests um, dated back to the date of collection, which are positive. And you'll see that is increasing as well. Um, it's up to 8.1% now. That's what's gonna be posted on the update to the dashboard tomorrow. And you'll see uh, testing volume as well is going up over the past week and a half for a couple of reasons. People are, there's more COVID, so more people are getting exposed, more people are being told to quarantine, there's more reason for people to get tested. And, and I do think ahead of the holidays, people wanted to get tested as well. To be very clear, increase in testing volume has no bearing on percent positivity at all. 
In fact, sometimes when you increase your testing volume, you see a little bit of a decrease in percent positivity. But clearly with both testing volume going up and percent positivity going up, very strong signal that, that we are experiencing a lot of COVID. And then most concerning to us on the bottom right, you'll see COVID patients in hospitals across the state. You see that big spike, um, you know, over 2,000 or so during that first wave. You see that second spike about 1,600 during the second wave. And then you'll see a very sharp increase right now. As the governor has noted, um, you know, last week we added 250 hospitalized COVID patients within a week. And that's uh, a rate of increase that our hospitals just simply cannot stand for very wow. much longer. What I'll do now is I'm gonna go uh, region by region. And, and I'd like to let you know that um, you'll note the regions look awfully similar. Every region across the state right now is, is experiencing very similar increases. So region one, which is the greater New Orleans region, we see increases in COVID-like illness. We see increases in new cases. We see increases in hospitalized patients. Region two, which is the greater Baton Rouge area, you'll see that notable increase in COVID-like illness, a sharp increase top right in new cases, increase in percent positivity, and increases in hospitalizations. In region three, which is the river parishes, you'll see the increase in percent positivity, increasing in new cases, increases in hospitalizations. Region four, same thing again, increase in COVID-like illness, increases in cases, high percent positivity, sharp increase in hospitalizations. In region five, which is the Lake Charles area, you'll see an increase in COVID-like illness, increases in cases, high percent positivity, increase in hospitalizations. Region six, which is central Louisiana, increases in COVID-like illness, very sharp increase in new cases, very sharp increase in hospitalizations. Going up north to region seven, increases in percent positivity, hot COVID-like illness, new cases, and hospitalizations. Region eight, very similar. Increases in COVID-like illness, percent positivity, new cases and hospitalizations. And region nine, very same again. COVID-like illness is up, new cases are up, and hospitalizations are up. When we looked at these um, criteria about a month ago, next slide please, um, this was from October 29th, we saw somewhat of a mixed bag. Uh, you'll see some, some green of decreasing some plateauing and some red. Um, that was our situation just, just shy of a month ago. I want folks to see what it looks like now. So if you go to the next slide, please, to see what that criteria looks like as of November 23rd. And it's just about red across the board. So we have every reason to be concerned about this. Um, you know, I want folks to, to know a little bit about what I've heard, particularly in hospitals, um, just over the past week. You know, we, to be clear, we still have capacity in, in hospitals across the state. Um, but the challenge here is that by the time you reach capacity in your hospitals, that's too late. Because hospitalizations lag a good couple weeks before when you start seeing cases go up. And it takes some time to turn this ship around. So if you wait to act until your hospitals are at 100% capacity, that is way too late and you get in a situation where people can't access care. Already this week, I've heard three things from hospitals across the state and people trying to access care in hospitals. The first thing I've heard is that people have had to wait a long time to get a bed when they get admitted from the emergency department. I know one hospital had to use recliners in the ER to let people wait while a bed opened up upstairs. The second thing I've heard is that rural hospitals or smaller hospitals are having a difficult time transferring in patients to tertiary referral centers. So not every ICU bed is created equally. And there are some conditions, large vessel strokes, complex cardiac conditions, um, a whole host of other conditions that really require the expertise of an advanced center. And there's only a handful of these centers across the state. So even if a rural hospital might have an ICU bed available, if a patient presents there and needs an advanced level of care, needs those experts, 
needs those specialized teams. If the tertiary referral center has no ICU beds available, they might have to wait for a couple of days before they get transferred in. That has consequences. That's a delay in care. And the third thing I've heard uh, from hospitals is hospitals are having to stretch already their staffing capacity. Um, a nurse on the floor that might normally care for four or five patients overnight, for example, is being asked to care for six, seven patients. These small things have consequences. And it's really just the beginning because we, we haven't hit capacity yet. So to me, that's a warning. That, that's a warning that we need to act now because there are a few things that we're working really hard to preserve in this state and the ability of people to access normal hospital care is one of those things. We really don't want to get in a place where people have to not only not have a bed available when they have an emergency, but we don't want people to have to d delay scheduled procedures at all because we know an elective procedure is only elective <laughs> for so long and if you delay it too long it becomes no longer elective. So we're very cognizant of trying to protect what's important to us in Louisiana. Um, and just to close, I'll say that the path ahead right now is dangerous. This is a dangerous time for Louisiana. And the reason I'm saying that is we know very well what trajectory we're on because we were on a similar trajectory a few months ago. What has changed now is a few things. Number one, it's now flu season. So that's extra patients in the hospital. Number two, the weather's about to be cold, which means more people go indoors, which means there'll be more transmission. Number three, we have the peak of holiday season coming up, and so that we know there's gonna be the temptation to gather, and that drives transmission. And number four, which is potentially the most significant, what is unique about this increase from our previous two is that we are now locked step with the rest of the country. And almost every other state is seeing increases. Almost every other state is seeing runs on hospital care and demands of their hospital staff at the same time we are. Which means that if we get into a position where we have to ask for help, ask for doctors and nurses from other states, they might not be available. In fact, I don't think they will be available because they'll be caring for their own state's patients. So we gotta act now because again, the road ahead could be, could be quite dangerous for us. Be happy to answer any questions about the data and if not, we'll turn it back over to the governor. Yep, Sam? Yeah, the, the challenge of answering that question is we're already seeing I mean, just about as, as steep of an increase as, as you can get. It really can't get much steeper than that. So um, I don't know, to be honest with you. You know, looking back to Halloween, I think Halloween was part of it. I think there was more. I mean, I think having increases in other states, I think it does bleed over. I mean, we were seeing increases in, in a couple of regions up north, Louisiana. And I think, I think everyone's tired. You know, I think COVID fatigue is real. I think we have to talk about it. And I think it's easy to, to get complacent. And this is certainly a wake up call. Um, you know, I, I think with the numbers they are now, even without Thanksgiving coming ahead, we're gonna continue to get worse uh, un until we really take some action. And we know um, that people need to, to act responsibly on their own as well. So I, I don't know how much more worse it gets um, with Thanksgiving, but I, I can't emphasize this enough. You know, I think for families out there that are hearing this and are trying to make the right decision for themselves and, and their family, I mean, just, just talk to somebody who's, who's, who's been on the other end and, and has had a bad experience with COVID or talk to someone that has worked in a hospital during the previous two surges. And, and after that, I think most families are gonna come around and say, you know what, it's, 
It's just not worth the risk this time around. Yes, Melinda. Small gatherings have been a larger component than, than months ago. There's no question about that, but it's just one slice of that. We continue to see a lot of cases tied to bars, tied to restaurants, tied to events, and tied to churches as well. Um, so it, it truly is multifactorial. And to the larger point that you're making, Melinda, which I think is a good point, the mitigation measures that we're going to be talking about are going to be significant in their effect, but not absolute. And the other side of that is that people really need to be making responsible decisions when no one's looking. No one's going to police your dinner parties, you know? Let's just be real about it. But, but I, I want families to take that seriously. I, I want families to know what the real risks are and to really make an informed decision. And, and I think the more family gets informed, the more they're going to say, you know what, this year, for my loved ones, it's, it's just not worth it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kanner. And just to highlight a couple of things she said, um, we've already been told, for example, that if we're going to request help from the federal government with respect to medical personnel coming to Louisiana to help us to increase our capacity to deliver care to COVID patients. There are 12 individual and discrete things that we have to do first. And we have to certify that we have done them before we leave and be considered. And, and that's a very strong indication to me that we cannot count on that, uh, which, which is a big difference between now and the summer surge or the spring surge, uh, because we did have uh, medical personnel available uh, through requests for the federal from the, uh, with the federal government at that time. Um, you know, another thing that's that's uh, that I think is noteworthy, and this is particularly true in central and north Louisiana. And I don't know how hard it is to go back to the gating criteria for regions six, seven, and eight. But if you go to six, if you, if you look out right of the summer surge. We never got those numbers as far down as we wanted to. So the baseline of cases and hospitalizations going into the third surge is much higher, uh, relatively speaking, than the state as a whole. Uh, and, and, and so we, we, we're, we're already in, in a in much more difficult place. And on top of that, and this is true across the state, is the non-COVID patient population is higher now than it was uh, either in the spring or in the summer. And if you go to number seven, or region seven, the same thing. Look out to the right of the summer surge. The numbers never came down anywhere close to where they were before the summer surge started. Um, so very high baseline there of cases and hospitalizations and the same thing, uh, region eight. Um, and, and, and look, our numbers are, are not good and, and they're getting worse everywhere. Um, and so I, I hesitated to even bring up region six, seven, and eight because people might think that's where uh, the only places we need to be focused. That's not true. Um, but I will tell you, it's a particular concern for people if you were in central or, or northern Louisiana uh, because you had such a high baseline going into this. Uh, and while we need absolute adherence to these restrictions and mitigation measures everywhere, um, you, you can see that it's particularly acute uh, in those areas. Um, so I'm going to go now and, and, uh, and talk a, a little bit about uh, the, the restrictions that we have um, coming up in Louisiana pursuant to a proclamation that I will sign later today. And that proclamation will become effective tomorrow. It will last for 28 days, uh, four weeks. Uh, this is clearly a statewide surge uh, and it requires a statewide coordinated effort. And by the way, these are the same trends that the White House Coronavirus Task Force when looked at uh, when concluding that our current measures are inadequate uh, to fighting this latest surge. Uh, the last time we announced our largest single day increase was in the summer, in July. Uh, that is when we took uh, action um, and collectively the people across Louisiana responded appropriately and effectively and, 
and we bent the curve. Um, and that action that we took then, uh, as I mentioned before, was phase two with a mask uh, mandate. Uh, so it's time for us to rise to the occasion once again to meet the challenge that is before us. Um, a little bit more difficult perhaps for the reasons that Dr. Cantor uh, mentioned, uh, but with the holiday season upon us uh, as we approach Thanksgiving in just a couple of days uh, and then transition into Christmas and Hanukkah and New Year's and so forth, we really got to pay attention to this now to make sure that we don't overwhelm our hospital's capacity to deliver care. Um, I do not want us to have to cancel non-emergency medical and surgical procedures again. Uh, that's not something our hospitals want. It's not something else the public health wants because delayed non-emergency procedures and surgeries uh, often translate into emergencies uh, later on. I don't want our doctors to have to make crisis care decisions that pit one critical case against another because there's a lack of resources. That would be a very dark place indeed. And fortunately, we've been able to avoid crisis standards of care in our previous ways because we worked together to flatten the curve. And if there was ever a time to step up and be a good neighbor, whether it's to your actual neighbor or to somebody in Louisiana you've never met, uh, that time is now. People don't stop having heart attacks, strokes, car wrecks, and so forth because there's a pandemic. Our hospitals are critical. And I would ask you to listen to our doctors, our nurses, our respiratory therapists, our EMTs. They're already doing more than their part, and they have been since March. It has been a very long nine months uh, for them. They are exhausted. Uh, we heard that over and over on our call with medical directors of hospitals last week across the state of Louisiana. So, so let's do this together for those you love and for our heroic medical professionals out there too. So in an effort to flatten the curve, slow the spread, save lives, ensure hospital capacity, and by the way, to keep schools open, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna move back to a modified phase two uh, and, and um, I'm encouraging all employers, public and private, this won't be in the proclamation, um, but it's, we know it's something that works. I'm encouraging employers, public and private, to maximize the use of telework where possible. I've already directed state agencies to do this and we're urging others to follow suit. Secondly, I am asking families um, to make sure that you engage in safe holiday related activities and not just for the holidays, but at any time. Um, and when you gather with those from outside of your everyday household, uh, that is a risky situation. And the more often you do it, the more times you roll the dice, the more likely it is uh, that, that you come up short and somebody's gonna get sick or multiple people are gonna get sick. And then when you have increasing community spread, uh, the dice are actually loaded against you. Uh, so asking you uh, not to do that, um, especially during the holidays. This is what the CDC is recommending. It's what the Louisiana Department of Health, Office of Public Health is recommending. It's what I'm asking you to do. It is imperative that we reduce transmissions. So start planning now for a safe Christmas and Hanukkah. Uh, and it is not too late to make sure that all of your Thanksgiving activities are safe as well. All right, similar to the last time that we were in phase two, uh, restaurants, gyms, and other non-essential retail will be limited to 50% capacity. A moment about essential, non-essential, I don't like that word because somehow we're saying one's more important than the other. We have always accepted the Department of Homeland Security category of essential, non-essential. This comes from CISA, the Cybersecurity and Information Security Agency, and we just adopted that. So anything that is deemed essential uh, by the Department of Homeland Security, we, we accept that. Uh, they, they are required to operate uh, safely, but without restrictions on, on their percentage occupancy. Uh, but for restaurants, gyms, non-essential retail, retail uh, occupancy limits will be 50%. Uh, I'm going to leave churches and places of worship at 75% capacity. 
Um, and remember, that's a maximum. Uh, you still have to be able to physically distance six feet between uh, members uh, who are not part of the same uh, household. Obviously, masking is important throughout this, and the mask mandate uh, remains in effect as well. Under the new order that I will sign this afternoon, uh, bars uh, can be open to on-premises inside consumption if they're in a parish that currently has a positivity uh, of 5% or lower over two weeks as per LDH's website. That website will update again tomorrow. Bars and parishes with over 5% positivity are allowed uh, to open outdoors for on-premises uh, consumption um, in patio or outdoor service, 25% capacity, no more than 50 people seated at physically distanced tables. All of the current restrictions remain in place uh, so that there's no bar service. You have to be seated. Um, it's closed at 11, no 18, 19, 20 year olds, uh, and so forth. All the other things remain in place. Obviously, takeout and delivery will remain available. Um, when LDH updates the parish percent positivity numbers tomorrow, um, there will be some parishes, uh, likely, uh, that will have to close to uh, indoor consumption. That was going to be the case regardless because we would have had parishes that were going to exceed their 10% uh, for two weeks, and, and that was going to happen. Um, but now there will be an opportunity for on-premises outdoor consumption that was not available before. Uh, and that's in keeping with this idea that what we know is outdoor activities are inherently safer than indoor activities with respect to, to COVID-19, especially when you have relatively small numbers of people uh, who are not closely interacting with one another and are uh, maintaining physical distancing. Indoor gatherings that don't fall uh, in one of the above categories are gonna be limited to 25% capacity. Uh, and no more than 75 people. Outdoor gatherings um, are going to be limited to 25% capacity, no more than 150 people where strict physical distancing is not possible. Spectator capacity at sporting events will be at 25%. Physical distancing and masking are essential uh, and required. And by the way, that's something that, that we need to, to make sure that we're communicating effectively. Um, of all the things that we're asking folks to do, wearing a mask is the most important. Physically distancing from people who are not part of your immediate household are the second most important. That's why the statewide mask mandate will remain in place in this proclamation. Uh, we know that it was a critical part of slowing the spread coming out of the summer surge. We know that it'll be a critical part of slowing the spread as we respond to the current surge. Um, and, and I'm asking everyone, every Louisiana, to do your part. By the way, we now know that it confers a benefit on you as well as on those who are in close proximity to you because you're less likely to contract uh, the disease if you have the mask on. And you're certainly less likely uh, to spread the disease uh, to those who are near you if you have a mask on. We are trying to do everything that we can to keep schools open. Uh, obviously, that's a local decision as to whether schools remain open for in-person instruction, virtual instruction, or for a hybrid approach. And I think that that's, that's the, the way it should be. Um, and of course, testing is, is key there. And our school districts are doing a good job across the state of Louisiana. Um, I do, I do want to say that we will issue, uh, I'll sign the order today. It will be effective tomorrow, in effect for four weeks, and therefore it will expire on December the 23rd. I don't want to create an expectation that come December the 23rd, uh, it is likely that we will reduce the restrictions um, on a couple of days ahead of Christmas. Uh, every, all the information that we can get uh, from the White House Coronavirus Task Force and other expert uh, doctors and scientists uh, in indicates that we're in for a couple of three really, really tough months here in Louisiana and around the country. Uh, so, so no one should believe that we're going to relax uh, restrictions at that time. Um, I just hope, I pray, I believe 
that we're not going to have to put in more restrictions, either on December the 23rd or before. Uh, but that's all going to turn upon the degree to which people in Louisiana, across Louisiana, all of us, embrace the challenge before us, remain resolute and focused, uh, and make sure that we uh, flatten the curve again. But if, if we stay on the trajectory that we're on, uh, we will have no choice but to come back and put more restrictions in place because what we cannot do is overwhelm our capacity, uh, our hospital's capacity, I should say, to deliver care. So if we're going to be successful, and I believe we will, we have been two times before, we all need to do our part. Uh, Every day, households need to stick together, reduce interactions with others outside of their households whenever possible. Activities that uh, do take place should happen outside as opposed to inside. Um, We know that the virus spreads more easily indoors. And in fact, the odds of catching the coronavirus are about 20 times higher. indoors and outdoors when you have the same activity taking place. Uh, In addition to the colder weather that's going to come over the winter, we're expecting rain this week, perhaps starting as as early as tomorrow night, but certainly by Wednesday and staying with us for Thanksgiving um, and the few days after Thanksgiving. And so even if you have already planned the safest possible event uh, at your house around Thanksgiving, intending for that to be outdoors, Um, there's a good chance that you're not going to be able to do that. And so you have an opportunity now to adjust your plans yet again uh, and make sure that you don't have uh, people from outside the same household coming together, multi-generational family members coming together. That virus doesn't know and doesn't care whether the person that you are going to spread it to is a relative. Doesn't know, doesn't care whether they're 80 years old or they have high blood pressure or uh, diabetes. And so we have to be extremely careful with this. Uh, And if you want to have the best possible Christmas in your family, where you're not uh, seeing loved ones in the hospital or potentially worse, um, then you really need to do this now. And not just at Thanksgiving, but, but every day is be extremely careful. The next few weeks would normally be the time for holiday parties of all sorts, Uh, office parties, uh, block parties, family parties, parties of different associations and and so forth. Um, Holiday parties are a recipe for disaster right now. Nobody likes a good party more than I do. Nobody likes a Christmas party uh, more than I do. And, And like everybody, I'm upset that we've got so many people across Louisiana who've worked so hard and done so much good this year, Um, whether it's it's with hurricane preparations or response or recovery or whether it's COVID and so forth. Um, And boy, there just wouldn't be a better time to have a party to recognize them and to thank them and let them have a a little bit of fun than, than right now. But the fact of the matter is it is too dangerous. And so I'm asking people to forego those parties. Uh, And Another message that I have for the people of Louisiana is now there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, And I don't believe it's a high-speed train traveling our direction. I believe that in a number of months, we're going to finally start to put this pandemic behind us once we have received and administered enough vaccine. And we could start this next month in small numbers, in small numbers. And it's going to take a while to get to the general population uh, like we need to. So this attention that I'm asking people to focus on this issue, um, I'm not asking you to to go ahead and get in your mind that we're going to have to mask up forever and physically distance forever. Uh, And in fact, I think there is an excellent chance uh, that next Thanksgiving will be among our best ever. And we're going to have, as we always do, so much to be thankful for next Christmas as well. Um, And so while there's COVID fatigue, and I know that it's real, Um, It is also real that we are looking for uh, renewed emphasis, attention, compliance for a finite amount of time. And and I hope that that inspires people to do what is required, knowing 
that they're not going to have to do it forever. But the next several months will be critical. Today, tomorrow, critical. Uh, just, just need everyone to be on this. Um, the holidays are about showing our, our love for the ones that we care about. The best way to love someone right now is by not giving them COVID. So like that says up there, pass the pie, not the COVID. That's our mission. That is, that is the mission for everybody uh, in Louisiana. We have to follow the common sense public health measures, these restrictions and mitigation measures uh, that, that we uh, are talking about. And it's not mysterious. We know that they work. They've worked before. They will work again, but we have to do our part. And the mask mandate is critically important. Staying six feet apart from those not in part of your household, incredibly important. Washing your hands, staying home when you're sick, and always taking care to make sure that we do what we can to prevent the most vulnerable from contracting this disease. Those are the people who are 65 and older. Those are the people with comorbid underlying health conditions like hypertension, diabetes, kidney disease, heart disease, obesity, and so forth. Yesterday was Public Health Thank You Day. So I want to thank all the people involved in public health at the Louisiana Department of Health and, and all across the state and all across the country. Um, one of the reasons, and I mentioned this earlier, one of the reasons we should all do this is because we owe such a debt of gratitude to the heroic medical professionals who've been working so hard uh, for many months now. Uh, and they're going to continue to work hard, but we shouldn't gratuitously make it harder than it needs to be. We should all do our part. Okay, so with that, I'm going to pause and, and take uh, some of your questions. Yes, sir. Governor, uh, epidemiologists in Louisiana seem to believe we might be getting diminishing returns here with these restrictions. There's a lot of things you mentioned, COVID fatigue and things like that. Are you concerned that the, the drop off that we saw after some of the previous restrictions were implemented is going to be more gradual and the indication sure. about, about my how and how to cook that? Well, you know, I'm concerned about an awful lot um, as it relates to COVID 19 and this pandemic. and there's not a decision that I have made that's been easy. There's not one um, that, that bring me any joy. Um, I am convinced, however, that if the people of Louisiana will embrace these restrictions and mitigation measures, uh, be patient and be selfless uh, and, and ensure uh, compliance, that we're going to flatten the curve again. That's, that's what I know. Um, there, are, there are no magic tricks to be worked here. I mean, the only way you stop a surge is, is by these restrictions and mitigation measures. And so I think with the numbers increasing here and around the country the way they are, uh, the sense of urgency that you see uh, coming out of leaders in Washington now, I don't know if you saw the White House Coronavirus Task Force meeting the other day uh, with the Vice President and Dr. Birx uh, and others, if you listen to to Dr. Fauci, everybody un should understand that this is a very, very serious situation, uh, and that we have to we have to do our part um, in order to slow the spread. It's it's got to be a collective effort, um, and and nobody should say, well, yeah, if if 99% of the people do it, that's good enough. I don't have to personally do it. Uh, that that doesn't work. That just doesn't work. We all have to see it as as a as a common. Uh, uh, effort that we all play our, our part and, and do our part and and look if if somebody had presented me a, another option a better option about flattening the curve I would have taken it I know we have COVID fatigue here and around the country if there was something other than wearing masks and physically distancing and washing your hands and staying home when you're sick and so forth man I, I would embrace it it doesn't exist that's why you hear this coming out of, of Washington and all the all the healthcare experts, how important uh, these measures are. So let's let's do it and and let's let's flatten the curve again. Um, and and again, I, I feel very comfortable that in several months, I don't know exactly when, whether it's April, May, or June, 
but in several months we will have enough of our population, I believe, uh, vaccinated that we can start to put this in our rearview mirror. But between now and then, we have to do what, what is necessary. Um, and I don't know if there's another surge after this one. I pray not. But we know we're surging now. So, so let's do our part. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, um, well, we're going to continue to work with businesses of all types and, and all of these venues to make sure that they understand what the restrictions are and what rules they have to abide by. Um, individuals and businesses can get more information on opensafely.la.gov. I think I got that right, huh? Opensafely.la.gov. Um, and you'll get more information. And, and will there be enforcement? Yes, there will be. But I'm going to say what I said back in March and every other time I've been asked about this. If the people of Louisiana insist that we enforce our way through this, we're doomed to failure. There are 4.65 million Louisianans. There are tens of thousands of businesses. And quite frankly, we can't enforce our way through this. We're going to be asking people to comply. We're going to, we're going to go and do uh, uh, compliance visits and we're going to respond to complaints. Um, and where people refuse to come into compliance, you can expect enforcement, but, but that's not going to get us through this surge. It's not going to protect the health of our fellow Louisianans. Um, it, it's better than, than, than not doing any enforcement, but we're going to have to have people doing this because it's the right thing to do. Um, and they're, they're just going to have to embrace it. Not that it's pleasant, but at the end of the day, these are people's lives that we're talking about. And we're doing our very best to strike the right balance between lives on the one hand and livelihoods on the other. And I will tell you, when it comes to the economy and to businesses and to employers and to employees, to livelihoods, the best thing we can do is put this virus behind us. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, and we currently have 372, uh, bar, they used to be bars, they've received these conditional uh, restaurant permits and now they're operating as restaurants. So there are 372 of those out there. Uh, now, they're not a hybrid, they're not part of a bar and part of a restaurant. They operate as restaurants if they're operating properly um, and they follow all the rules for, for restaurants. Um, and for the other establishments that continue to operate as bars, they need to operate uh, the way we've outlined here today. Yes, ma'am. Uh, what are you doing for your Thanksgiving celebration? I know you have a son who must be coming home from college because the LSU is going virtual for Thanksgiving. Yeah, I have a son who actually lives here um, in Baton Rouge, uh, and and uh, he he will uh, likely uh, be coming home to spend some some time uh, with us. Uh, I will tell you that we'll, we'll stay uh, in Baton Rouge at the mansion. We're going to have a Thanksgiving meal that will consist of uh, the immediate household. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, we're going to give thanks. Because even, even during this pandemic, which has been so tough on people, uh, even, even after three hurricanes that hit this year, we still have so much to be thankful for. God has truly blessed us. Uh, Thanksgiving is a day to, to give thanks, um, and, and that's, that's important to me and to my family, uh, and we're going to do it. Uh, but last year, uh, I remember my 85, well, she was 84 at the time, year old mother came. Um, I still have six siblings, and they all came with their spouses and their children and their grandchildren. Um, I don't know, 80 or 90 people, something like that. You won't be seeing that this year, and you won't see it at Christmas either. Um, I hope and pray that if you're with me on Thanksgiving Day in 2021, you will see that. And I believe that you will. Uh, but between now and then, we all have to do our part. Yes, sir. Governor, did you tell legislative leaders about their uh, new restrictions before they were, uh, you came out here today? And if so, what was their Yeah, I, I did. And, and first of all, you need to know that we routinely send data um, and information to 
the speaker and to the president. Um, and we have complete transparency on the data that we're relying upon because we, we update it every day except for Saturday. Uh, we also have uh, sent legislative leadership and, and I think maybe everybody in the legislature, uh, every White House Coronavirus Task Force uh, weekly update that we get when we get them. Uh, and then uh, this morning, in addition to those things, uh, we presented all of these gating criteria slides uh, to the speaker and to the president. Uh, talked about where we were, especially in light of uh, our hospital capacity and talk to them about the need to, to go back to a modified phase two in order to uh, flatten the curve again. Um, they uh, asked some questions, um, uh, expressed concerns um, that, that to make sure that, uh, for example, whether it's the fire marshal's office or the alcohol tobacco control office, that, that we are working with proprietors uh, and bar owners to the maximum extent possible so that they know what's expected of them and they're given an opportunity um, if they're operating in good faith, and the overwhelming majority are, uh, to come into compliance. And really that has been our approach uh, throughout. I think that was, that was a large part of one of the previous questions we got around enforcement. Uh, we have always been over backwards to try to make sure that individuals understand uh, what the rules are, give them every opportunity to come into compliance, and then only after persistent um, uh, shortcomings and, and really um, uh, a refusal uh, to, to come into compliance uh, do, do any real enforcement actions like citations uh, take place. So that was one of the things that, that uh, the President uh, of the Senate mentioned uh, in particular uh, and something that I reassured him our approach to that would not change. Yes, sir. Yeah, no, so it's a great question. Uh, the question's about vaccines. Uh, first of all, we, had a, we have a draft plan in Louisiana that we continue to update and revise every single day. Uh, and the reason it's a draft plan is because we still don't know the day that we get the first vaccine and we don't know exactly how many doses are gonna be there. Um, I have every expectation that somebody, sometime uh, around the middle of December, we should receive a number of doses of the Pfizer vaccine first. Um, we don't know how many. It could be as few as 30,000, might be 60,000. We, we, we don't know for sure uh, right now. And then we think that uh, the first doses of the uh, Moderna vaccine would come about a week later and perhaps in a smaller number initially. Um, and, and we continue to work with our, our federal partners. We had a call uh, just yesterday with Secretary Azar, uh, and he also had on the call General Perna, uh, who is in charge of, of all of the logistical aspects of Operation Warp Speed, and that is once that emergency use authorization is granted by the FDA, um, I think he said within 24 hours, uh, vaccine would be en route to the states to the locations that we've identified that we want them shipped to. Um, and that first uh, 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 shipment of vaccine, I can tell you the first priority will be the healthcare workers. Um, and, and then we will then focus on high risk groups, principally uh, folks in nursing homes, uh, assisted living centers, in congregant uh, shelters, um, congregant settings, I should say, uh, those, those older folks. And then, and then we have a, a list that expands uh, from there out. And ultimately, we, we want to get to a place where we put out the call for the general population to go out and get their vaccine, uh, and they can go to their health unit, their doctor's office, to a hospital, to a pharmacy, um, and get, get the vaccine. Understand it won't be one and done, uh, because you've got to have a second dose within 21 days or 28 days. It depends on which vaccine you get. Um, and more vaccines may come online uh, over time, and some of these some of these things may change. Um, and, and I don't want the talk about the vaccine as promising as it is and as critically important as it is. Nobody's more excited than I am. I don't want to talk about the vaccine and the fact that we may have um, a few doses here next month to cause people to not pay attention to what is the imperative right now. 
Um, that's why you hear Dr. Birch and Dr. Fauci, Secretary Azar, Brett Girard, all of these people talking about bridging to the vaccine and actually doubling down on the mitigation measures now. Because uh, that vaccine is not going to be here in the numbers that we need it soon enough to reverse these numbers that we went over today. Um, it's, not, it's not going to, to, to happen. Now, I do want to mention, since you asked a question about the vaccine, um, I have every confidence that when the FDA issues that emergency use authorization uh, for a particular vaccine, that that vaccine will be safe and it will be effective. Uh, and, and I hope that my fellow Louisianans will embrace the vaccine because a vaccine saves zero lives. Vaccination can save a lot of lives. But the vaccination requires the vaccine and it requires an individual to receive that vaccine through an injection. In fact, through two injections. So, so please understand the FDA uh, has not cut out any steps required for the safety uh, to evaluate the safety and efficacy of, of these vaccines. And in fact, the trials uh, in terms of the number of individuals participating were five and six times that normally you would see in a trial because they wanted to make sure uh, that it was safe. And they took steps uh, to develop these vaccines uh, rather than taking them sequentially and, and causing a long period of time to elapse, they took them consecutively at the same time. Um, and, and, and they started the mass production, for example, of the vaccines while they were still going through the trials uh, and, and, and trying to get the, uh, the emergency use authorization. So that if that authorization comes, they've got vaccine to distribute and more being manufactured and you're not having to start that manufacturing process uh, from the beginning. So I really want Louisianans to embrace this uh, and, and to understand uh, that, that the vaccines will be safe and effective once the call goes out uh, for these vac vaccinations to get started. Yes, ma'am. Um, on that subject, in terms of the cold storage, do we have enough in the state, mm -hmm. or is the state going to have to put some money into creating the cold storage that's needed around the state? No, we, we've identified the cold storage uh, capacity that we need uh, pursuant to our plan to administer, uh, and that's the Pfizer vaccine, uh, by the way. Uh, and it's a, it's a combination of cold storage capacity uh, and dry ice. Uh, and and uh, we we're, we're going to be in good in good shape there, um, and, and this is why you have to have a really good hard work going on well in advance, uh, so that working with hospitals and universities and the private sector, you can identify all the cold storage capacity that you have, figure out where it is, how much of it is available uh, for these vaccines, and then you plug that into into your plan, uh, and so so. That will not be a limiting factor in terms of, of receiving uh, the, the vaccine. It makes it logistically a little harder because you have to receive it at those sites and then distribute it from there. Uh, they're still evaluating how long the uh, vaccines remain stable once, once they thaw out um, and that sort of thing. But, but we're going we're gonna to be all over that and, and, and make sure that when that, when that vial uh, thaws out, that is, it is administered while it is stable. Uh, and and uh, making sure that, that people come and get that second dose as well. Offline? Dr. Kenner, did you want to say anything about the dry ice or the, no, or the cold storage? Look, um, I want to thank you all for continuing to, to, to cover this. We, we anticipate that we will not have another press conference until next week, um, and uh, I'm not sure when we will, we will let you know. Um, as I mentioned a while ago, Despite how difficult this year has been for all of us, um, our families, our individually and, and as a state, there's a lot uh, that we should be thankful for. And that's always the case. So Thanksgiving is about uh, giving thanks for the blessings that we enjoy. Um, and I would encourage people to find ways to, to have a Thanksgiving celebration that is safe so that we can uh, be thankful for the blessings that, that we have. Um, but we have to be mindful of this pandemic. Um, and there are dangers lurking if we insist on having celebrations around Thanksgiving or Christmas or New Year uh, the way we've done them in the past. And, and so I, I just cannot more strongly encourage people to be patient. Uh, I know you're tired of this. 
uh, but be patient and, and, and love your loved ones by making sure that you don't expose them to unnecessary risks. Be close to them uh, through the phone and through FaceTime and, and, and other, other ways. Um, and then let's, let's look forward to when we can uh, get back together without restrictions and mitigation measures and, and we're all gonna have good stories to tell unless between now and then we're too risky in our behavior. And instead of telling good stories, we're gonna be lamenting the fact that we didn't do what we were asked to do. And that some of our loved ones won't be with us when the time comes to celebrate in person. When that next birthday comes, when that next Thanksgiving and that next Christmas. So I encourage everybody to do your part. You've done it before. We can do it again. Um, and I'm not asking you to do this forever. There's a finite amount of time. I can't tell you exactly when, but in several months, I believe we're gonna be able to start to put this in our rear view mirror, but it is not today. In fact, not only is it not in our rear view mirror, it is right in our grill. And, and it is a nasty, nasty situation here in Louisiana like it is around the country. So we don't have a moment to waste. Everybody has to do their part. And if we do, uh, and I'm sure that we will, uh, then, then we're gonna get through this. So I have every confidence in the people of Louisiana. They have always inspired me by their goodness, their kindness, their generosity, uh, and I believe that they will do it again. So let's work together. Let's save lives. God bless and thank you.